Guys, this is Randy Ritchie. It is April, which is Arab American Heritage Month, whether you know it or not. And today, in honor or commemoratum of Arab American Heritage Month, we're going to honor probably the greatest and most well-known Arabic wrestler in the history of the sport, the Iron Sheik. Now, if you haven't, you have to see the documentary about the Sheik. It was put together so well. This is a man who came from a country where you could be killed for your religious beliefs, okay? This guy came from next to nothing. In the first place, his family struggled with farming, primarily pistachios. They didn't even have running water in their home. But he looked up to a great amateur wrestler, and in countries like that, your great athletes, your Olympic athletes, are held in such high regard. One would imagine that most people from Sheik's era, most young men, looked up to him like they were a god. So long and short of it is this. Iron Sheik had the kind of spirit or mentality, okay, that said, he came from my hometown or from near my hometown and having all those humble beginnings in a nation that was just so controlled. He just started to dream as a young man. It probably got him through a lot of hardships that if he can do that, maybe I can do that. And once he put his mind to it, he did. He excelled at the high school level. He excelled beyond the high school level. He made the Olympic team for Iran, and he won no Olympic medals for Iran. I think he did finally win one when he came to America, but he won enough acclaimed amateur wrestling, Greco-Roman style medals and achieved so much that the government then forced him into the military. And because he was such a well-known character over there, he was actually a bodyguard for the Shah of Iran before he made it to America, to the United States where he could live free. Now, there's not a lot online about it with the details, but at the end of the day, I know there's a lot to that story where he risked his life for freedom, and I can't think of anything more patriotic than that. When Cosro got here, he was uh, so easy to work with and such a likable individual, he almost immediately became a coach for the Olympic wrestling team for the United States of America, shortly realized that that was a decent life, but not the life that he wanted. And then he dug up or searched up Vern Gagne, and that's where he began to do his training. And for everybody that doesn't know, it's all over the place how hard the training was for the American Wrestling Association and in Vern Gagne's unheated barn with a broken ring with, uh, with uh, chicken shit all over it because they kept the chickens in the same barn that they trained the wrestlers. He came in, I believe, with Ric Flair, Kenny Patera, and, and others. Those are the ones that are jumping out to me. But they were trained by Billy Robinson and Vern Gagne. And she could not understand in the beginning the difference of pro wrestling and amateur wrestling. And he struggled with the way that we did things here. And the thing is, when you look at how brilliant the Sheik was, and go ahead and do that, he wasn't the Iron Sheik. And they brought him in under another name to do a little feud at the request of Bob Backlin, the three-year reigning WWF champion under another name, to see if there was chemistry there. And the chemistry between these two guys, two guys that could actually shoot, that were actually tough, that were actually accomplished as wrestlers, got in that ring. The matches are amazing. I forget, he wasn't even wrestling as the Sheik. I wish I could tell you guys the name, but I can't. But if you go... 
into the search bar on YouTube and search, you'll see some amazing matches. Before they found, we started to really do it for money, and that was just to test cause, bro. Now, we all know about Hulk Hogan and the Iron Sheik. The way that went down was this. Bob Backlund would not drop that title to Hulk Hogan because, true to life, there's no way Hulk Hogan could defeat Bob Backlund in a real wrestling match. However, Backlund would drop the title to the Iron Sheik because of how accomplished, how tough, and the believability of his professional performances, the Iron Sheik. And I never knew this, but the way that finish went down is Bob Backlund came into it, and the storyline behind it was that he had an injured neck, and Sheik just worked and pulled and tugged and beat the hell out of Bob Backlund's neck. And his second, Bob Backlund's second, was Arnold Scone, who finally threw in the towel, making the Iron Sheik the first ever Iranian WWF champion. And then she came to terms with Vince McMahon Sr. slash Jr. at the time. And he would go ahead and put Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan over for that title. Now, the story has been proved to be true. At the time, there was a lot of heat between Vern Gagne and Hulk Hogan. And because of the fact that Kaz, the Iron Sheik, was trained by Vern Gagne, Vern offered him $100,000 to break Hulk Hogan's femur in that match. I can imagine that the Iron Sheik thought about it, but at the end of the day, money wasn't just everything to him, and the Iron Sheik went ahead and did business instead of being concerned about where he would go from there. And as a result of that, he became one of the most recognizable, most memorable characters in the history of our sport, no matter where he went. Sheik has gone through so much, guys. He's gone through, as we all know, addiction. Uh, and with that comes alcoholism. Sheik lost his family for a couple of years, and Sheik got clean and got him back. Now, the most terrible thing that the Sheik went through was the death of his daughter, his 27-year-old daughter. I believe this was in 2003. And I didn't know it. I guess I knew it, but I wanted to block it out or maybe forgot it. I think I forgot it on purpose. She was murdered by her boyfriend. One can't even imagine losing a child, but losing a child in a violent manner like that. It's so upsetting. You can go online yourselves because I don't even want to think about the details of how she died and how they discovered that she had died. And I can't even imagine what this did to the Iron Sheik, a man with so much pride in real life, a man with so much culture in real life, and a man that could basically tie up in knots and break in half and honestly... <laughs> put them in the camel clutch and make them humble if he wanted to when this happened. He had a plan during the court date, and he was going to uh, go ahead and he was going to go to prison for the rest of his life, thinking that that would kill the pain of losing his daughter in the violent matter that he did. Thank God for his middle child, because his middle child caught wind of it. Her new dad was up to something. And she grabbed her dad and begged and pleaded silently in his ear and told him, I've already lost my sister. I can't lose my father. And that made Sheik rethink what happened. Well, at the end of the day, karma hit that son of a bitch because he died in prison. There aren't a lot of details there, so I don't know exactly what happened or what to tell you. The heat that this guy had, and you guys will never understand the term kayfabe, what kayfabe really means. The last place that was kayfabe in the wrestling industry in the United States of America was in the Memphis Territory. I was lucky enough to cut my teeth down there. And I know what kayfabe was because I seen guys get fired for taking their masks off in the car less than 100 miles from the town and a fan saw them. 
I've seen guys get shit canned for acknowledging each other in a restaurant when one was a baby face and one was a heel. And I'll be goddamned if I almost didn't get fired because I was at the end of one pool or uh, end of a hotel pool as a heel and the baby face was on the other side. So I got my ass out of there so I could keep my spot. This was a serious, serious thing because this is how we fed ourselves. We could not lift the curtain. Even if people thought that, we could never confirm to them, you know, that kayfabe. We had to keep that kayfabe. I used to have to wrestle in the opener or the undercard, and I would have to completely leave the building, come dressed up, get a ride from someone else and carry a separate gym bag and also different clothes and a mask and walk back into the building so everybody could see me and believe that I was the heel when I walked into the heel locker room. And that's how it was. Well, she had so much heat. He's been stabbed numerous times by fans. Fans have rushed the ring on him. And people used to try to kill him and threaten to kill him. He had his wrestling medal stolen from him in the hotel room when he was at the building performing. They used to have to find creative ways to sneak him and his tag team partner, Nikolai Volkov, in and out of the building because they had that much heat. USA, Khafui, I read number one, you know. Uh, Unbelievable. But here's what I want to say about Sheik. With all the shit that he's endured, okay, and he has endured it. Things have not been easy for this man and everything that he's got and he's worked hard for. But this guy lives such a lesson to be learned from because through it all, he's always mustered up enough gratitude to laugh, to have a sense of humor, and to make others laugh and to give Uh, his fellow man, that laughter, that enjoyment, you know. Here's the thing that I just can't stand about these smart marks and these wrestling fans. He is the Iron Sheik. He is a tough guy. I have been with him when the fan, and I'm going to say fan, yes, because they call themselves a wrestler, but they were better off for the wrestling industry when they were buying a ticket than trying to be a wrestler because they're no wrestlers. They'd get too comfortable with the Sheik, okay? And I've seen Sheik in terrible pain with his knees, but he still made the towns and made these goddamn car rides. The Sheik had an umbilical hernia sticking out of his belly button where he looked like a marsupial. So that alone, as I can tell you, I've had four umbilical hernias. is so painful. Even going over bumps or in the car potholes, it hurts, okay? And here is Sheik with his arms full, and someone said the wrong thing. Some fan got so comfortable with him that they went ahead and called him Sheiky Baby and called him a jabroni, and he dropped that shit, and all that pain went away as he chased after that guy like he would have been his prime, man. That's just not cool. How can you have not not have the respect for a guy like this, an absolute pioneer that has showed so much courage and strength? Just because he's funny, don't be stupid. Have some common sense and pay homage and have some sort of respect for a man with those type of achievements. Now, I'm not talking about kayfabe, but you should honor a man like this and don't get too comfortable and think that somehow you're on the same level and you're going to get over on the Iron Sheet by making a fucking joke, okay? And I'll bet you even at this stage in his life, and this is probably 15 years, maybe 20 years after I seen that instance I told you about, when you approach that man, approach that man and realize that you are looking at greatness, Is he amazingly humorous on the internet? Is he amazingly humorous on his personal appearances? Is he amazingly humorous when he's on the Howard Stern show? Goddamn right he is. I don't know how a man who's been through that much and absorbed so much in life can find the the juice, the energy, the balls, the guts, to be so funny and muster up the charisma that this man can at the drop of a hat. 
you pay that man respect. And I'm not talking about he's unapproachable and not friendly because you know within five minutes that he does care about his fellow man despite all the gruff exterior and the mustache and the fact that he is one of the most infamous heels in the history of the industry. Show him respect that he deserves in the meanwhile. Don't try to be cute and funny with this guy. He doesn't, there's nothing that warrants it. And again, he's a man that's earned that respect. I don't care what age he is, okay? My personal experiences with the Sheik is I've wrestled with him a dozen times. And I can, let me just put it to you this way. The first time that I booked the Iron Sheik, when I first started promoting wrestling in 1998, I believe it was, I don't know, I think he might have still been on WCW TV, but maybe shortly after, he meant something. It was a time prior to the internet, and you couldn't get a hold of the Iron Sheik, and guys like the Iron Sheik to wrestle these independent shots unless you knew them or knew somebody. So I brought him in for a small show. The building said 1,000 people. 1,000 people came to see the Iron Sheik versus the guy from this local town. Nothing against the guy from this local town, but he was, in fact, what they would call an outlaw wrestler at the time. A decent, nice guy, but an outlaw wrestler at the time. So when they wrestled, he comes back, and all he had to say is this. "My, But, but the, the people are saying I could barely beat an old man. Well, let me tell you the answer to that. Yes, he was an old man, and if it was a shoot, it would have ended in one minute, okay? <laughs> Number one, like I told you, I've seen the Sheik get angry, and that anger all of a sudden kills the pain in those knees, and he was flying after somebody. I'm not kidding you. Number two, you don't know how to wrestle if that's how you wrestle, and that's what the people perceived after you worked with the Iron Sheik. I could probably right now, as it is, go out there and do 10 compelling minutes with the Iron Sheik, and they would think they were looking at the Iron Sheik from the 1980s, okay? So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about with the disrespect. You work around those things, and it's always been that way in the history of the business, okay? But... When I work with the Iron Sheik, he's just the best, man. He will show up on something that I'll, I'll see him on, and they'll go, Fox, you're the Sheik tonight, right? And I say, well, no, Sheik, I'm supposed to be working with this guy. Oh, what? Fox, good psychology. I'll talk to promoter. Don't worry. It'll be Fox and Sheik tonight. You know, that's how I want to be remembered. And I either call him Cos, Cosro, or the Sheik, or Sheik, you know? I don't get too comfortable with him. I've been in the industry for a long time. I do have some respect from the Iron Sheik, from Sheik, from Cosro. But I don't act like I'm on his level because at the end of the day, am I a wrestler? You're goddamn right I am. But I've never been an accomplished amateur like he is. And we have to understand where he came from in the amateur wrestling, the Greco-Roman style, but we also have to realize he comes from an era where Bob Backlund would not put over anybody else because at the end of the day, in real life, Bob Backlund could beat the living shit out of Hulk Hogan. He would not drop that belt after that three-year run to somebody who the people would not believe in their subconscious, like Cosro, could beat him for that title. Okay, guys, thanks for letting me listening to me wax poetic about one of my heroes, uh, somebody that I will always look up to, consider myself extremely grateful to have ever been in the ring with the Iron Sheik. Again, this is Arab Wrestlers You Should Know, sponsored by Premier Pro Wrestling, being brought to you without YouTube commercials. So please be cool, like, and subscribe. And if you want to support Premier Pro Wrestling, the links will be in the description. Thanks, guys. Talk tomorrow.